five rupees to that price. When I compare that with what is happening to Chinese manufacturer, it's only two rupees. Yeah, because energy is cheaper, it's more available, uh, the quality of power is better. So if you look at an Indian factory, like in my mind or most people would see, there are four generators, there are two UPS systems, and there are 40 people that man this entire utility, uh, including the compressors, uh, for 24 hours a day. 40 people are only engaged in making sure that I get the right power and the right quality of air compressed air. So that is the kind of cost we are running. So 5 to 2 is actually quite uh, quite generous in favor of India. If you look at the cost of finance, most companies in India, SMEs that make things like this, are borrowing at anywhere between, I would say, 12 and 40 percent. The Chinese company gets it to 6 percent. Uh, an American or a Japanese company gets it almost at zero, 1 percent, 2 percent. So obviously the cost of finance is a huge bad thing. So in India it's five rupees, in China I'm just saying it's two and a half, maybe it's two. The third discussion is about what I call raw material export, but let's call it the whole logistics. We don't realize how expensive it is. So in my company in uh, in, uh, in in Noida, my power bill per day, including the diesel and everything, not the manpower, just the energy cost, is one lakh rupees per day. My freight bill is eighty thousand rupees a day. So it's not so small. It's a very large bill. Because most uh, of my raw material is imported from Korea or China or Germany, and it comes to a port in JMBT in Bombay or Chennai, and then it gets onto a container or by a train or onto a container by a truck, or sometimes a less than container load on a truck. The amount of time it spends from China to Bombay is almost equal to the amount of time it spends from Bombay to Delhi. The surety of when it will reach Bombay is quite high, when it will reach Noida is not so high. Even at the moment, uh, there are no trains available for containers to come from Bombay because we are not exporting enough. So all the containers are stuck on this side. Now, unless you export, they won't go back. Or somebody takes a decision. Yeah. And now there is some other crisis with the with the summer. As if summer is only happening for the first time, we are told all these rails are now busy with pushing coal into the north uh, from wherever the coal is coming. Which means again the trains are busy. So for the last two weeks, no shipments are coming into Delhi, or very little are coming. So when you look at that cost, it's two and a half percent in our business in China is less than one percent. Maybe even less. Okay. I've only added these three figures in red is what I'm talking about. And there are two other figures in red, but those are to do with the tax for central sales tax. Just to say that policy can sometimes be deprecated to a business. So there is a simple tax called central sales tax of two percent. So when I talk to the government, they say it's only two percent, why do you keep talking about it? But it's two percent only if you manufacture. If you import it from China, there is no two percent. And it's not vattable, which means I cannot get the credit for this tax. So every time I add value, so my uh, uh, zinc supplier in uh, Merit, he buys zinc from wherever, and he adds value and sends it to me, I have to pay 2%. When I sell my capacitor to my customer, I have to, he has to pay 2%. When he makes the capacitor and sends it as a light, he has to pay 2%. When the light is sold to you as a consumer, you pay that 2%. So it's 2% every day and through the supply chain we calculate it's about 6.8% 6, 6 is the total impact of that tax alone. Which is very large for supply chain but only look at my thing is 2%. But if I add that up, you will find that my profitability and everything else being equal, assuming that my manpower is as productive, assuming that my raw material costs are the same as China, and that is an impossible assumption. Because obviously the country is far more integrated, the ecosystem is good, they won't be able to do that. So what I'm saying is that if there was no import duty, like there is no import duty in capacitors, on, on computer there is no import duty, you have no case for manufacturing in this country. However efficient I become, I cannot be buying cheaper than China in my raw material. I can only buy equal. Yeah. I cannot, my manpower can be as productive. It cannot be better because those guys have been running these factories for a long time. Their scale is huge. I'm talking of 4 million a day, they're talking of 10 million a day. And the 4 million we are already very large from an Indian perspective. So, you will find that the profitability is so 19% is only 9.5%. Now, to do a business like this, I need some investment in capital and working. For, because it's a high investment business, I need 80 rupees for every 100 rupees of sales. One, almost 1 is 2 or 1 is 1.2 or whatever the ratio is. So does the Chinese. But so the return on investment for me is 12% versus 24% in China. And then the Chinese government is very export oriented, or at least was until the last regime. They give them a VAT refund, which comes to another 8.5% incentive, yeah, which is about half uh, the VAT, 17% VAT, which is something they get as an added advantage to export. 
And that makes the return on investment 35% almost versus 12%, three times more. And that's a difference of almost 20, 25%, which is why you find most Chinese products of same quality, I'm not talking about bad quality, forget the bad quality part of it, of similar quality, is at least 20, 25% cheaper than an Indian product. Which is a lot. As a consumer, I would say, why the actual aspect very much more, I would buy the Chinese. I don't care. Yes. That is another reason why no company in India should play the cost game, because you will not be able to compete with cost. So we are trying to do many things in India through policy, trying to form clusters, for example, to bring down the cost of power. We can't change the power situation of the whole country, but can we do it? And Mr. Modi and the government hopefully is working very hard on making sure some of these transactional issues, interest issues are solved. So maybe in five years we get much better. We have got much better. I mean, if I do this chart five, ten years ago, it was even worse. So it has got better. But suffice to say that there is a huge gap which doesn't let us play the cost game very much. We can only play a value game. We have to convince our customers by giving them more than just the product that they expect or just the service they expect. And which is why we are becoming a service economy. Because manufacturing only is coming in. That is sharing your the same thing. Would my children want to get into manufacturing? They don't. They would rather open a restaurant or join city bank or sell uh, sugar water or go for branch My apologies to them. Because those are high paying jobs. Those are the ones if you can convince me to to buy more sugar water so that I get killed faster, you would get the highest money in the world. But if you start doing manufacturing, this is dirty work. You have to come into my factory, roll up your sleeves, and start repairing a machine. You know, or drive something towards higher productivity on a daily basis. That's not easy. This is not easy. But this is what makes a country in my opinion. So, not that I chose this, as I said at the beginning. But now that I'm in it, I feel that this is extremely important for me, for our country, for several reasons. So we need to also look at areas like this. Services are tertiary, good, please make money out of services. But if everybody in the whole country dreams of making another Facebook or Flipkart and sees that that is the only way to become rich, we are not going too far as a country. We can, we can you probably are going far as a person. Yeah, so that is the other reason why I always feel that value is extremely important. So now talking of value, a friend of mine, Hans, who is my uh, co-author of this book called Value Magics and who I work very closely with in my consulting job, my training job, uh, we have also the website, it's also a book now. It's called The Magic Palette because a palette is what you export, you use to export, and magic because you can create magic with these palettes that I will show you. So what we have done is just use the palette to develop a model. So as a life, there is always a consumer, that is why any business comes in. And this is a business that starts by making a capacitor for example, and then there is a business in the middle, someone like Philips, who will convert that into light and give it to you as a consumer. In real life, there might be many such businesses in the middle, yeah. hundreds of them. So just for a what we said that, so there is a business that starts something, he normally sells to a business. In many cases, there are very few businesses that sell directly to a consumer. So while we talk about B2B, B2C, the truth is that most business is done B2B. B2C is only the interface at the end. So, what does this consumer do? The reality is that you buy things because you see some benefits. And I'm just putting common sense on a value. As a buyer, I buy things because I see a benefit. Whether it was my clothing, or the shirt, or my cell phone, or computer. Everything, I'm doing it because I see some benefits. What those benefits are, we will open up that cart and see what is inside. But I don't buy the best in the world always. Because for that benefit, I need some sacrifices. And one of the sacrifices I have to make is always price. So I say, I want, I always buy value, good value for money. So I mean, I'm buying the maximum amount of benefits available at the price point at which I know. But actually, in real life, we make more sacrifices than only money. The price is not the only thing that we are paying. That is more. Yeah? So that is the sacrifice. So I, am, I will, as a consumer, decide to buy, or your wife will buy, or your spouse will buy something. As long as you see that the amount of sacrifices you are making is equal to or somewhere close to the benefits. If I am making a large amount of sacrifices and the benefit is less, I will not make that purchase. Right? That's good. So we understand why this guy buys 
Now, based on this, what I need to do here is either increase the benefit to it or reduce the side effects. When we play the cost game, we are only working on this one. We are saying reduce the sacrifice compared to the competitor. I am not even bothered about the competitor. Right? And I am not bothered so much about the benefit because the end has to go to the end. So that is the life of a consumer. Now look at the life of someone like me, a manufacturer or producer of any service also this is like I have only two realities in my life. I have something called the cost of means. There are some costs that that I have to incur to run that business. It's the cost of my material, the cost of the manpower, the cost of uh, uh, you know the money that I borrow to run a business like this or, or I put myself in the business. So there are some costs and these costs are what I call comparative resources. Why? Because they differ from one country to the other. The cost of manpower is not decided by me. It's decided by the country. Not only legally but also in the marketplace. If suddenly all civil engineers are being used in the DMRC, then the cost of a civil engineer will go up. If I'm in the construction business, my cost will go up. And it's not something that I control. So these are the costs that I sort of are given. With that resource, there is something I do. And what I do is what I call value add. Every business adds some value to those costs. Every business in the world has some input. And it does something with that. It adds some value. And in our opinion, those values are also limited. Yes, so I will just open up the boxes and this guy in the middle, whatever cost I have, to which I added some value. So I have a cost of my material, the films, the foils, the wires, the sprays. I put all that together and I manufacture something. And then with that added value with my pocket in it, I pass it on to this guy in the middle. And so when Philips or a trader acquires this, this is what I call the cost of ownership, to which he adds some value. Maybe he makes a light out of it uh, or he trades it. Or the, the cigarette baller outside just buys a carton of cigarettes. The only act, value he adds uh, is he gives you a delivery when you want it. That's also value because that's the benefit you see. And that is how we transfer to the consumer. That's business as it is. But if we explore that a little bit, explore it, the word is, you will find that the five costs of resources that this guy has, the five costs of means that they have, are these five in my opinion. Every company in the world has some material some way of input you might call it, uses some machines <coughs> or you could call weather, sometimes there is no machine, somebody is doing it manually, uses manpower, money and finally minds. Now you might say minds is a resource, do we pay for it? Yeah, that is a very tricky one and a very interesting one at least in Deki, that's what I, we do. Because what we do often and I will show it to you later in some slides is that we hire manpower and we assume that this manpower has no mind of his own. That's how we treat people. So we say, okay, you are hired from tomorrow, you are a worker, you go and operate machine number 32. Here's the manual, this is the training group, we will train you for three days and then you will go and work on social. The method is set. What we are telling him, without saying so much, don't use your brains. Method is set. Do exactly what we asked you to do. So what we are inviting into the factory, I am paying, I tell my HR guy, we are paying for the full person to be there with us for 8 hours. But what we want out of him is only his hands, his eyes, look at what is happening. Oh, there is no material, pick up the material, put it on the machine. Use your hands to put it down. And not only one machine, you have to operate 5 machines, so use your legs to put it up and down. But that's it. Those are the body parts I am interested in. I don't want your brain, I don't want your heart, I don't want your soul into the business. That is what unfortunately we end up telling you. But a company that uses the minds effectively will not do that. It will use the people to think differently. How can we reduce the cost of these four and other ends? And how can we increase the benefits or the value add? And that is the crux of business in a lot of cases. Yeah. So what is the what value can any company in the world add? Now whether that's Nokia or whether that's Philips or whether that's uh, Colgate uh, toothpaste made by Unilever or whatever. They can only do five things in my opinion. Every company in the world has some technology. They can add value in terms of technology. Yeah. By making a better phone, by buying technology and making a better camera, uh, you know, by making a better shirt that is uh, that, that does not need ironing. It's basically technology that we use. Or you can produce, there is some production you can do. You need to market it, so that's also a matter of value addition. Some companies just buying a shirt from Bangladesh and saying it's Tommy. 
selling at a bigger price. So it's marketing, but it's not nothing. I would not pay $200 for nothing. I pay $200 for Tommy. And my Tommy, okay, that's a big story. So there's companies who are engaged in uh, what I call marketing, uh, logistics, because there is some word of movement all the time, and finally support, which can mean pre sale support, how to sell, uh, after sale support if something goes wrong, how to use this product, etc. Et can you think of a sixth thing that any company in the world does? We developed this model with a lot of thinking. It is our challenge that these are the only five things that any company in the world does. Some companies do only one or two and some want to do all five. That's their choice. They will do at least one, otherwise they're not a business. So, uh, if you look at uh, even uh, Anwala outside, he's doing only one, which is logistics. He doesn't market, he doesn't put a brand outside there. He just put a shop where you want to buy a cigarette or a bar or whatever. And so he's doing only logistics in that case. Yeah. Somebody else is adding a little more wealth, etc. Et so if you look at a garment uh, manufacturer in Gurgaon or in Bangladesh or in Noida, maybe he says, no, no, the design is not mine. I don't design it. So Tommy Figure or Arrow comes to me and says, this is the pattern of the ship. You will buy the fabric or I will send you the fabric by the truck. You will cut the fabric to this length. I will calculate the wastages. You will stitch it like this. I will send you the buttons from a Chinese factory. I will do it. That's the lowest form of business from a manufacturing end. What we call a CTC, cut, trim, cut, uh, whatever the word is. Yeah. Basically, I'm being paid by labor rate. So I'm using these five things, but I'm only claiming only production is my only job. Even logistics, somebody else is doing because the truck is coming to you. Maybe a little later he'll say, okay, I like you, you're a good company, you work for one year. You know what, hereafter, I would also want you to handle logistics. I will give you the names of the supplier of the fabric and the buttons. You call them up, place a purchase order with them, you buy it with your money, right? And then give me the finished product, and I will pay you for it. That's like slightly more value added. So along with production, now I also start doing some logistics. But a little later, I might say, you know, Mr. Tommy, We've been working with you for 10 years now, but I also have some in-house designers. So Indian designers are very good. Would you like to see some shirts that we have designed? And the designer from Tommy might say, hey, this one is interesting. Can I get that? I want exclusive rights for you. We'll do it only for you. But I will charge you a little more now. Yeah. So I'm also now getting into the technology phase. Some kind of designing I'm beginning to do. Or I introduce a new fabric. Because this is pure, natural cotton, organic cotton coming out of the fields. So maybe this guy starts buying and gets interested. It could be designed from any level of technology. But I might also say, my brother says, you know, while you're doing all this business, why don't I start our own brand on this side? Because it's not in contravention of what we do with Tommy. Fair enough. So we make our own dinky shirts or whatever. Put another brand on it. Start doing my own advertising, my own branding. Nothing stops me. I become also a marketing company, at least for part of my business. And of course, all businesses have some sort of support. So I could choose as a business to add value in one of these elements, in all of them, or in a combination of them. Yes, that is for me to decide as a company. So as they keep deciding we go all, somebody else might say, so they had an offer from Philips long ago, many uh, years ago, when my father had decided to invite me. So Philips said, here's the deal. We will buy every single piece you make. But Deki will not be a brand anymore. They will only call Philips capacities. It's not your problem. Unfortunately, he had the good sense to say, no, I don't want to get it. So they asked him, why won't you? Because you are not making enough money at the moment. You'll make more money. With he said, no, because I left my job because I wanted to be master of my own enterprise. When I start supporting you 100%, I become your slave. That's what his word was. I don't completely agree. But it's how you, what your reason to be in business is. He decided not to do it. Fortunately, he did much better. Some companies decide to do only that. They say, okay, we make it and give it to you as a man. Making is our job, the rest is yours. But obviously in that case, uh, you don't see this consumer at all. Right? So this is the reality of the business. The first manufacturer, any manufacturer. Now what is the reality of you as a consumer? Okay, let's look at that. So we said you buy something because of a benefit. Right? So what benefits? We all know. Somebody talked about quality earlier, right? So the far end here. We know that we buy things because of quality. 
even this bottle of water, I am picking it up, I see bisleri, I see it looks nice. Even if it didn't say bisleri, it said something else. But suppose it said butter, I would be surprised. This butter is water. It's not a connection I make. It will stop me for a minute. But if butter also, I want to know is it the butter that I know? Or is it some guy who would know who is calling it butter? You know? Like I know it's not the butter I know. Because I don't make butter make shoes, I don't make water. I don't like the association of shoes and water. But more I realize this butter looks a little fake. And I have to say name, that would be my next page. Because as a benefit, I don't associate quality with what I see. So I'm not going to check quality from a water quality perspective. I'm not looking for a certificate of what PPM residue does it have. Yeah. But I also buy things for design. I like this shirt. All shirts that uh, the brands I buy are very similar quality, so I have no problem with quality. But I like the design, so that's the other reason why I would buy something. I would choose one over the other. But I also choose it because of speed. Like I said, in the case of the medicine, but only in the medicine. Now there's a lot of online shopping. Yeah. You like something and you say, okay, I want to buy this. Oh, but it's going to come after three days. Can you not deliver it to one day? Why? Because I want to go to, I don't know. Uh, my daughter wants to go to a birthday party tomorrow and she wants to wear it tomorrow or something. So speed is also important. Now if, if that online shopping guy said, we have an express delivery. For 50 rupees more, we can deliver on the same day. I would take it. So that's again a benefit I see. Yes. The third reason I would buy something, or fourth reason, is the image. Sometimes I look good. Uh, come on, driving a BMW is a BMW, right? So let's drive a BMW. If I can afford it, I would go to that. Because of the image, what that brand could produce to me. And that image can be on your pen, it can be on a cell phone. And sometimes it's just that, it's also, I will uh, explain to you, image also from a perspective. So Hummer. How popular is Hummer in US today? you have any idea? Well, Hummer. You know the big one that Arnold yeah, Schwarzenegger used to drive? It's quite popular. Not sure. Sorry? I'm not sure, but yeah, I mean, we see it. I mean. You see it in India now, but how popular do you think is it in the US now? I haven't. It's not popular. It's not popular. It's not not popular. popular. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's almost just a Why? It's not worth it. It's costly and not so good. Somebody who buys two crores of a car, they're not worth it with a few. Not in the US, they have to use very cheap. So why is it not why is it not popular? Sorry? Party or right, change of image. Why? What's wrong with the Hummer? Hummer is a fuel guzzler. It is environmentally damaging. It is environmentally irresponsible. If something else can drive me ten kilometers in a liter, this damn thing drives me one kilometer in a liter. So what kind of an image am I creating of being an irresponsible citizen? My footprint, carbon footprint is too big. Now in India, that's not such a big image problem. In the US, it's becoming a big problem. All the Hollywood stars have no, no armor anymore. Out of my garage. Nobody wants to be seen with armor. Yeah. What is the image of a uh, of a guy driving Tata Safari, for example, with those big headlights on the top, you know, those floodlights in Gurgaon? So you see, this bugger is some Zabindar ka beta. He's just sold his land and he's got himself into some yeah. loud music. Some beat with you the land. It's the image. I will not drive a safari for free because of the image that I connect with it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, uh, what is the other car that Mahindra has failed actually in that car? It's a sumo. Not the other one. It failed because it became a taxi. Yeah. So everywhere you went, all the taxis were the same. Yeah. So I don't want to drive something that looks like a taxi. So the image can be in many ways. Now if I understand that image, I can do something at this level, use my mind to produce something or design something that doesn't look like that. You're getting the connection. So image is not just, everybody doesn't want to look. Some people won't wear a, a shirt with bling on it, I won't. Because it hurts my image, There's nothing wrong with bling, you know. Oh, my son would. So also I don't want to create an image. So we are, everybody is also making a decision based on image. And the image doesn't necessarily mean, sometimes image will mean no. I don't want to take a chance. I want only a cross pen because I know it will never fail me. It will always work. So image can also be because of quality. I have no other way of knowing the quality of water. But when it says bisleri, the image is, if it said avian, 10 times the price, oh, I'm sure the quality is great. I can't taste the difference, but I'm paying 10 times the price. Maybe because, yeah, so if you're a Bollywood star, then you would buy and drink only avian. So 
So image also has a lot to do with it. And finally service. Whatever you buy, we want to buy, even if it's uh, a service like uh, an Airtel or a phone. I also want to make sure that that service element is taken care of. Yeah. And uh, that's an example today. I don't know how many of you are suffering with Airtel. I am. My wife is and my kids are. Because the service is something gone down. <coughs> so if there are drop calls and stuff like that, you can still understand. But people are not getting messages. When you give them, you give somebody a ring, and it rings. He says, I never got the call. You know. And then you get a fat bill, and when you want to complain all the bill, nobody wants to listen to you. So the service standards are falling. Now this company, like Airtel, if you ask them what is your big problem, they'll say costs are big. Consumers are not talking enough. Our average, if you ask them what is your big challenge, strategic setting with Airtel, not very far from here. I know they were looking at some of them. And their big strategic session is how do we increase the average what, what is the average call? Uh, uh, no, uh, average realization per person. Uh, so they've got a fancy term. It's like hotel room. Uh, so average realization per room used to have AR. They've also got some AR uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they are looking for that. In my opinion, you are doing the wrong thing. You are not realizing why people are leaving it. You are not realizing why. They may not be leaving it today because again, value also is competitive. So I say, I want to, uh, I want to throw this phone away. I want to go to Vodafone. Maybe I meet somebody who says, hey, I don't do that because Vodafone is worse. <laughs> you know? So I don't do it. It's not that Airtel is true. So if people are beginning to take their eye off the ball, as I say in this business, it is because they are not looking at the benefits of why somebody buys something. It's basic common sense what we put there. But we don't go into those details of saying, why is it that? What are the benefits for the Okay. Benefits are clear, but I don't buy the best always, like I rightly said, because I have some sacrifices to make for every benefit I want. And the biggest sacrifice we know is in terms of price. Yeah. So that's why I give up the largest space. But that's not the only one, as in the case of the Hummer. The guy, uh, Schwarzenegger, has no problem with money, but he has a problem with image. And image, while it's a benefit, he says, no, no, I'm making a sacrifice in terms of the planet. Every time I use a bottle of water like this, I'm throwing away this plastic. I have an impact on the environment. So I would like uh, to make less of an impact. Can I not get a bigger bottle for my house? This is a nice one. But now in airlines they all serve you these small ones. Because nobody wants to, to serve you all the time. So the one set pockets. Can you imagine the kind of environmental damage that's happening because of that? Yeah. Or McDonald's. I think that burger has uh, is only spells damage to me because in terms of packaging, in terms of the ketchup and the chili sauce and the mustard or whatever it is, and the, the number of tissues you get and then the fi final packing you get, it's a huge disaster. Forget what it does to your health, but it also is a disaster. But we are all embracing that. Someday, that image will change. And maybe our kids will say, no, no, no. Can I get something without the packing? And we are beginning to do that now. In many places we say, no, no, no shopping bag. I'll carry my own shopping bag. So we are getting a little more, but it's not come to an image scene. In some countries, Scandinavian countries, I know, that you will be, everybody will frown upon you if you carry a plastic bag. Yeah. In uh, Starbucks, for example, you will see there is organic coffee, but there is also responsible coffee. You can look at the labels sometimes. Yeah. And in US, at least in many other countries in Europe, they are selling, they are selling some coffee more expensive than that. Be a responsible citizen, buy a responsible coffee. What do you mean by responsible coffee? Well, this is the coffee where we have Fair trade coffee. We have made sure that the coffee farmer is getting fair wages. That he does not use child labor. That there is no slavery being done, no water being used. Oh, now I am a little more satisfied. But till yesterday I didn't bother about this. Now when I see fair trade, it's a fashion statement today. Ten years down the line it will be a hundred percent statement. If you're not fair trade, you cannot sell coffee. So a lot of things come from the image of because some people are beginning to feel that planet, so there is yes. Uh, about this fair trade coffee, uh, don't you think this is more of a marketing gimmick rather than basically? Because uh, there is some research analyzed this issue. They found that fair trade, whatever you call fair trade, basically you give the farmer maybe ten percent more, but you double the price of the coffee. So you are actually, you know, in the sense, you are possibly creating a value, but actually, but you are creating, creating a profit rather. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. But yeah, from the farmer's perspective, I mean, I'm sure you would say, if it's free market economics, someday the benefit sacrifice will be there. You are right. Today, why should I pay double, you know, for example, for that cost? You are only doing what you were supposed to do. But for it to come to that stage, 
everybody else will become like Starbucks. When everybody starts selling today, Starbucks is using this as a so like I said, value can only be created in two ways. It will always be created at the customer end. And it can only be created to either increase the benefit to the customer or lower the sacrifice in the price. Those are only two ways that we can do it. Yeah? So I reduce your sacrifice. And how do we transfer this cost to the manufacturing unit? Like this extra expenditure is coming to cut the carbon footprint or reducing yeah. the value in the society. How we transfer this cost to the manufacturing? Like they have to produce a they have to produce a product in a safe, safe way. Like yeah, not even uh, uh, not necessarily. Yes. Okay. So two things can happen because that either my cost can come down or go up. If you go up, in this case, or you know, or I can do something smarter with my technology of production. 